Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the sports section. It's Long Island's longest-running call-in program in the same time slot for 40 years. That's right, since 1981. But during COVID, the callers are the hosts. I'm Matt Mankiewicz, Ken Furman, Zach Wilson, newbie Kerry Quinn joining us, and Mike Anderson should as well. But you won't be hearing from them just yet because Ken and Zach talked to women's soccer coach Tobias Bischoff yesterday, and we're going to play that interview for you and then get down to the nitty-gritty. But right now, Tobias Bischoff, women's soccer coach here on WUSB Stony Brook. Zach Wilson along with Ken Furman here for the sports section on 90.1 FM WSB Stony Brook, the longtime home for Seawolves Athletics. And joining us today, we got Stony Brook women's soccer head coach, Tobias Bischoff. Tobias, thank you for joining us. Hey, Zach. Hey, Ken. Um, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. No problem. So, as I understand it, you, you and the team just wrapped up a Saturday session, according to Instagram. How did that go? It went well, and we're getting ready for session number two for today, but we'll actually start at um, at 4 p.m., but I'm happy with the performance uh, from the morning. The girls worked hard, and um, you know that's what we're looking for at this part of the preseason. How great is it just being able to get you know everyone back, being able to do these training sessions, get things as close to normal as they can be, uh, you know, still during under a pandemic, but again, you know, way better position than this time last year where it, the sport wasn't even being played in the fall. Yeah, can we? We are happy to be back. We're happy to be together again. We're happy to play. We're happy to represent the university, um, Stony Brook. Um, it's it's great to be back. We do have restrictions. Um, it's not a normal preseason for us as it uh, used to be before the pandemic, but um, we are handling the situation, what is dealt to us with ease, and um, we're getting ready for another exciting fall season. Yeah, I know there's still some social distancing, uh, obviously, in play. Obviously, in terms of how far uh, your girls could travel, obviously, it was another factor. Can you kind of talk about working through those restrictions and producing? It's, it's really more that um, we didn't have a proper spring season. The spring season is, right. um, is used by us to set the foundation for the upcoming fall. And we, we didn't have that because the spring season was, um, was a competitive season, was a successful competitive season, but it was competitive. And therefore, we have slight restrictions um, for right now uh, for the fall. Um, that basically means that we are not going every day and um, going twice every day. We we start a little bit slower than we would normally do. We have days where we train only um, once during the day. Um, and this is the part where we're in right now. Um, but today is a day where we can train twice and we will take full advantage of that. Well, the UCZ this summer is pretty much different from what we usually see, but what is going to pretty much be normal is your regular fall schedule coming up, which, of course, the first game is at Hofstra in 12 days. So how does it feel for a schedule like that to once again be normal? Yeah, it's, you know, it's exciting. We get more games. In, this, in the spring, we were limited with our, our number of games, um, but the fall, so we have, we have our full slate of games. Uh, very exciting. It's an exciting schedule. It's a very tough schedule. And starting, starting at Hofstra on um, your old stomping grounds on August 19th, um, with um, Hofstra receiving votes for the top 25. Um, very good team. I do know the team very well uh, being a former associate head coach at Hofstra University but um, that's going to be that's going to be a tough start for us um, it's always a great game against Hofstra well coached Simon Radioff is one of the best coaches you know, in the country and uh, we will have our hands full but we got, we're going to get ready for it and we uh, you know we will we will approach the game as we always do we want to show our best and um, and try to win the game. After that, we have Quinnipiac at home. That's the home opener, August 22nd. Super excited for that to get our first 
game at home at Laval Stadium. Uh, Quinnipiac and Nador, very good team. They were in the final of the MAC Conference Championship uh, for the last two years. So that will be a tough game after that. Um, we go out to, uh, to LIU, play LIU, who were in the final of the NEC uh, this spring uh, before we start with Columbia. It's you know Ivy League team who didn't play in the spring. So not really sure yet what to expect there. But um, knowing Columbia from the past, they will be a very very good team it's a very competitive team in, in the Ivy League uh, will be uh, will be an interesting game for us then off to Providence you know Big East very good team and after that let's get on an airplane fly out to Colorado and let's try our best against the Pac-12 team at Colorado who as we all know is a, is a powerhouse and yeah. constantly goes to the NCA and you know advances in the NCA. After that, Farley Dickinson away, tough game before we have St. Joseph's at home and Cornell at home. And those are the last two games before we start um, our conference games. Yeah, no, it is a great non-conference schedule. I, I'm just looking back through the program's history. It might be the, if not one of the most competitive non-conference schedules in program history. And hats off to you, obviously, for and the team as well for getting a lot of those opponents uh interested in competing against Stony Brook and vice versa, you know, putting yourselves out there and, you know, accepting the challenge because it is key. And with that as well, I kind of want to ask, what is it like, how important is it getting off to a good start, especially against these competitive teams in non-conference play? Because you look at last year, Stony Brook dropped its two non-conference games uh, against ranked Tostra and UMass. And ultimately you saw the team turn around after that go on a long winning streak up until the end of the regular season, ultimately winning the conference title. I mean, yeah, can you, you're right. It's, it's, it's a very challenging non-conference schedule. And we, and we knew that um, going into this year, but it's, um, it's in preparation for, for conference play. And um, there are tough games, but um, in all of those games, um, we just need to be a little bit better and we need to learn and we, uh, we need to we need to win those games. We have to find the winning mentality in those games to be prepared for the America East. The America East is a tough conference. There's multiple teams um, who can who can win the conference. It's um, it's every year. It's um, it's very competitive, and um, we just trying our best to get ready for that. And coach, after the last few NCAA tournament appearances the women's soccer team had before you arrived on. At Stony Brook, you appear to have given them the next step in how they play in the NCAA tournament. It all started off two years ago when you helped the team get its first ever NCAA tournament goal against Penn State. And just recently in the spring, you got them another goal against Ohio State. How do you see them being able to put up those types of scores in big games like that as a huge step for this program? Yeah. I me as a coach, I've been to the NCAs um, multiple times now, and um, we scheduled some games in the non-conference part, Zach, what um, actually is supposed to help us in the NCAs, should we uh, be able like, to win the conference championship and make it to the NCAs. And um, we did that in 2019. You know, we, it's, a, it's a tough, it's a tough you know, task to, to be asked to play your first round game um, at Penn State, what is um, one of the powerhouses in the U.S. Um, but I thought we had a pretty good game plan, and um, you know, kudos to that 2019 team who followed the plan um, very well, and we gave our chance to be successful there. To be honest, and we were winning one nothing at halftime, and it was definitely exciting. But we also knew that in the second half, uh, Penn State you know, has a different gear to get to. And um, they did that and we ended up losing that game. Um, looking back to last year when we had um, Ohio State uh, in our first round, um, you know, we prepared for that game. Um, we gave up two goals early on, um, scored scored a goal to, to get back into the game to make it two to one. But um, unfortunately, 
you know, couldn't keep that momentum, ended up losing the game. Could, we could have probably scored another goal somewhere, but Ohio State is, uh, I mean, it's a fantastic team, very well coached, and um, yeah, they deserve to to beat us on on the day and and move on in the NCAs. But for us, um, we play a tough non-conference schedule um, to get ready for conference, and then between the non-conference schedule and the conference games what we have, um, we are trying to get ready to represent America East in the NCAs if we if we get to that point. And um, you know it's a it's a learning it's a learning curve. So you have to be there, you have to understand the situation, like the, the pressure, the different style of play, the different speed of play, um, what awaits you in the NCA. And um, we did that over the last couple of years and we will keep working on trying to to be successful at the NCA level and uh, win our first NCA game. That is the goal. And with that, I think we should transition a bit to some of the stars that are going to be taking the field uh, for your team. I think first and foremost, you got to mention Alyssa Francis. You know, coming back for a graduate season, she had a great 2019 season and a good 2020 season in the uh, abridged 10 games. Let the team goals of six, uh, 14 points as well. I mean, just talk about her leadership, her playing ability, what she brings to this team, because she is so dynamic. Yeah, I mean, Alyssa is a fantastic player, and um, and so is Chelsea. And um, we are we are thankful that they decided to come back and um, and play for for our program for for one more year. Um, they both scholar all Americans. Um, and they they good players and they they even better people. I mean, Elisa is um, Elisa gets it done, you know. And you play, she plays as a, as a forward for us, and um, she has her her ups and downs during the game during the ninety minutes. But um, if you look at the score sheet by the end of the day, like very often, Elisa's name is on that score sheet, and you know. We're thankful that she plays for us, not not against us. And uh, <laughs> of she has she has she has something what um, is not easy to find, and that is um, the nose for the goal. She knows how to score, and she she does that quite often. I'm sure she, yeah. her goal is for this year to be again successful in front of the goal. And you know, we got to help her as a team to give her the chance, and she got to help us um, and just putting the ball in. And I can so imagine. Good yeah, yeah and I can that. imagine that one of her teammates that could probably help her is also another star on the team, Chelsea DePonte, who has tallied four goals in each of her last three seasons for Stonybrook in the nine games that she played. She had herself a, a great year, a great season recently as well. She also won America East Woman of the Year along with all the other distinguished award, honors and awards she got with soccer. So, how do you see her? and Alyssa Francis gelling together for another season, working on that special tandem that you have helped create. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we have enough time, Zach, to go through all the awards what those two got <laughs> over, over the last couple of years. I mean, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, again, I mean, Chelsea is a great player and a great person. Like, she is the clue to our team. Like, she keeps our team going on the field and, and off the field. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to find a better person than, than Chelsea is. Um, her and Alyssa know each other very well. They play together for a lot of years now. Um, they know their tendencies. Um, so we hope that um, those two can um, combine as well uh, this year and so that we can be successful. But uh, we do have a lot of other parts um, you know, on our team, members on our team who has to, who have to step up and support those two. We can't just put um, all of the games on, on those two. It's, um, it's the 11 girls, the 11 players we asked to start the game. It's the people who have to come in in the middle of the game to give us a boost. And it's also the people who are on the bench supporting the team. Um, you know, all parts of our team is, is important and but you know, you you absolutely right. Like those two um, are leaders in the team, um, leaders of our program, and um, yeah, we're looking forward to working with them for for one more year. I think it's interesting too because you know, just going through the roster, I think something unique about this team is there's a lot more upper class women who are going to be uh, prevalent 
not only in the lineup, but just in leadership roles. Because going into your first year a couple of years ago, a lot of these girls were sophomores or juniors. And now they are currently juniors, seniors, graduates, whatever the case. And, you know, really looking at a lot of potential players who are going to fit that starting lineup. I mean, it's virtually going to be all juniors and seniors, with the exception of a sophomore or two. So what is that like getting those players who are now on their third season under your system, as well as them leading the several recruits and freshmen that joined the team over the offseason? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, can we try to figure out like right now what um, what the team will be like? Um, you know, if you look through our roster, you will recognize that um, we, you know, we lost 12 players from, from last year and we brought, uh, we brought in 11 new players. That's a, that's a pretty significant uh, turnover with, within the team. And yeah. we are going, you know, that's what we try to do right now, day by day, training session by training session to, to see who are the, the 11 who give us the best chance um, and start a game for us on August 19th at, at Hofstra and also who are the people who we can count on uh, giving us this this extra boost, um, you know, during, during the game. So we are trying to figure out right now what the team will, will look like. Um, obviously, with losing so many people and also losing six starters from, from last year, um, there will be a lot of new faces um, representing Stony Brook University in the fall of 2021. Yeah, yeah there's interesting names, you know, to run down to potentially fill that. Is. For example, you know, Alicia, Alicia Diaz, who came in, uh, last season, uh, Ariana Barber considering some of role. Both of them would be forward midfielders, you know, defensively as well. Potentially seeing someone like Maddie uh, Sleeman uh, get that potential starting role. But someone I want to talk about who I think really impressed me last season was Emma Beattie, who was a freshman uh, in the spring of 2020 and came in at one of the starting spot as a defender. Can you talk about her growth and impact on the defense of the team? Yeah, there's actually there's actually two of them. There's um, there's Emma P D and uh, right. Carrie Pearson and Carrie Pearson. So um, those two came in last year for us and um, and did very well for us. Um, don't forget Carrie scoring in the semi final. You know right. we were we were we were the better team against against Vermont, but uh, we were losing. In the giving up a goal in the first minute, and it took us till I believe like seventy second, seventy third minute, something like that, where uh, we actually made it one one, and it was Kerry Pearson who who gave us this um, this one one who opened up the the gates for us a little bit to score a couple more, ending the game in a three one win for us, and moving on to the final against Binghamton. But those two, um, they did very well for us last year. They do had um, a little bit of an advantage that um, I actually coached both of those players uh, growing up in, in one of my youth teams. Uh, so they knew me as a person. They knew what I was looking for. And I think that made a transition for both of them um, a little bit a little bit easier. Um, and they both did well. But um, as you pointed out, Emma Beattie had a, had a good spring. You know, uh, pretty successful, uh, dynamic player who is um, defensively strong also, who can, you know, it's a two-way player basically on the outside for us. And um, yeah, it was, it was great to see her playing well for us in the, in the spring. And after your practical come from behind semifinal win against Vermont, two days later, you faced off against Binghamton, the America East Championship, and you guys struck first after the departing senior, Fanny Gunnison, was able to pick up her first and only goal of the season. And the game, along with Anderson Richard, Richmond Burke being able to pick up three saves as well. That game was a big nail biter, as you would expect, with that being huge championship aspirations. How did your team feel like they were able to once again step up to the challenge against a Binghamton team that was coming off of a win against the against the UMass Lowell Riverhawks, who were apparently hosting the America East Championship at that time? Yeah, funny. Fani saved the goal for the biggest moment of the year. That's what she did. Um, now, Fani is funny special, you know, and she uh, she played 
she played good for us all year, to be honest. Um, you know, big, big difference maker, but um, it just didn't happen for her yet that she scored. But um, you know, against against Binghamton, I thought we had a good game plan against Binghamton, and it worked out very well in the in the first half. We scored actually pretty early in the first ten minutes. Um, Alyssa with the with the assist to Fani, but there was also. Uh, Chelsea and other players involved just before that, like how we played out of a uh, pressure situation where we where we won the ball and run a beautiful breakaway scoring the goal. Um, overall, it was it is a nail biter. Um, but Zach, as you as you know, um, finals are never easy. Semi finals are mm-hmm. never easy. So those games um, always come down to the little details. And I thought that uh, on that day. We just were a tiny bit better than Bingham. The Bingham is a, is a very good, very good team. Well coached. Neil does a good job with them. You know, overall, we did have a shot advantage. I, th- I believe it was 14 to 12 shots. Um, I thought the first half we had, we were pretty dominant against them. But in the second half, um, they had also a couple chances. Um, but in the end, after 90 minutes, we were the team who who won. I thought we, did, we deserved to win. But um, yeah, beautiful goal by Fani, what helped us winning the second championship in a, in a row after winning 2019 as well. You know, the well-earned victory, as you said. And it was interesting, too, watching that game where, you know, you didn't immediately, once you score the goal, go into that prevent defense, that defend lead defense where you're sending, you know, eight, ten girls back. You know, you, you stayed on the offensive for a lot of that game. What was that like in terms of, you know, knowing, yeah, we got the lead in our back pocket, but this is a Binghamton team that can score if we give them a breakaway, potentially. Oh, yeah. I mean, they are super dangerous. Mm-hmm. They stay super dangerous. Um, Especially at wide. They're super dangerous out of the game, but they they also uh, dangerous on set pieces, and we, and we knew that. Yep. Um, the reason why we kept going for it is, I mean, from a tactical point, you score early on in the, in the eighth minute. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a long way to hold on. But to be honest, Ken, like, you know, we are a team what's, what likes to go forward, what likes to create uh, scoring opportunities, what likes to score. And we were looking to to put the second ball in, uh, put the game, I don't want to say out of reach for Binghamton, but make it a little bit harder for them. Right. So the goal is to somehow figure out to get a 2 nothing lead and, um, you know, then get into a situation for the last 10 minutes where we trying to hold on to, to that lead. But uh, that was not the case. So therefore, you know, as Sex said, it was a little bit more of a nail bear bite than, you know, I may hope it would be. But again, you got to give credit to, to Binghamton and what, what they did in, in the second half and that they found a way to create a couple of chances against us. Yeah, you had a good answer for them. And they'll try and find an answer against you when you host them in the conference slate this upcoming season. Is it fair to say that you may have some way about way of being able to try and play against them or is it too early to talk about it? I, it's too it's too early to to talk about it. I mean every year every team sec every every year every team is a little bit different. Like right now we're still trying to figure out like what is our identity as a team and um after I know that then I can look into into you know, our opponents um, we starting with Albany this year in, in, in conference play. What is a you know well coached, very strong team. Obviously, they uh, they, they found a way. They found a way to beat us in the in the spring. One nothing. We didn't have a good day on that day. But after we figure out like who we are, we then take a look and take a look what our opponent is. And after that, we come up with, with a game plan. So it would be too early now to say, like, what are we going to do against Binghamton? The only thing what I can tell you is, Zach, that we are going to try to score one more goal than they do. <laughs> of course, Ed. It was well. I'm glad you brought it up, you know, especially finding the team identity. Yeah, you, know, you obviously don't want to give away too much in a tactics department. But something I'm always curious in is the somewhat unique offense that your teams are able to run because you got so many great two weeks two-way players, both in the attacking midfield and as well midfield defensively, you're able to really rely more on that 4-4-2 uh, formation as opposed to more conventional 4-3-3. Are we going to see something like that next season where we're going to see more of a mix between different types 
of formations and set pieces on the field? Ken, don't ask me to give up my <laughs> things yet. Um, no, I'm, I'm, again, I have to, you know, I, if I would know, I would tell you. Uh, I yeah. don't know yet. I got to still figure out like what our, what our, what our okay. team. I mean, it, it is, it is pretty known that, um, that we like to, uh, to function out of, a, out of a four, three, three system. So yeah. I just got to see if um, the pieces come together this year to do that, or if we have to make um, small adjustments and oh. do something a little bit different this year. I was going to say, with 442, we saw that work pretty well. So one of your favorite professional teams in Bayern Munich or in the pro leagues, I and mean, wow, did they dominate this year? Yeah, they, you know, they, they good. They have to buy them. That's my, that's my team. Yeah, I follow, follow all of, all of their, um, their programs from the first team over the women's to uh, the, um, their youth teams, their campus system. Yeah, that's, yeah. I like to, I like to watch FC Bayern. That's, that's my team. Yeah. Yeah. So after the last few seasons, the American East playoffs have, of course, been starting with the semifinals and then to the championship. And we know that NGIT just became a member last year. But has anybody been saying anything about there being starting with a core following yet? Because I'm seeing some schools' websites about that being a possibility. Would you mind asking this question again? That, that I, I, I don't think I understand, understood you right. Um, it start, so the last few years with the America East playoffs, there's a semifinal and there's a championship. Has yeah. there been anybody saying anything that's going to start with the core final this year? Um, yeah, I believe so. I believe there will be, uh, there will be six teams back in the, in the conference championship. Um, so we will have... We will have those rounds. Then we will have the semifinals after that, and the and the final after that. So um, I'm under the impression that there will be six teams uh, in the playoff system for this year for the America East. That's going to create a lot more fun competition when it comes to the playoffs. After we've seen just after we've seen the playoffs starting off with the semifinals over the last few years. I mean, you've seen that with Stony Brook over the last two seasons, and now the field has expanded. Yeah, I mean, it makes it. It makes it interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, six teams in the playoffs. That means there is there's a buy for the number one seed and the number two seed, um, meaning that um, we are going to have our last conference game this year on a Thursday. Um, if you find a way to be first or second in the conference, you get a buy. That means you don't have to play that upcoming weekend. Um, and you can just rest up a little bit and get yourself ready for the semifinal game. Um, however, if you, the team who is on sixth place and who uh, were able to uh, to catch this last place in the playoffs, um, it's it's up to you. You have a chance to uh, to win a championship because you know in the end you got to be in it to win it, how they say. And um, upsets are happening, and especially in a in a competitive conference like the America East, um, it doesn't matter. You just got to be in the playoffs and you can, everybody can beat everybody. And all of a sudden you find yourself in a final and you're 90 minutes away from uh, representing the league in the NCAs. I'll agree. And, you know, with that as well, you spoke too about, you know, the importance of obviously just managing all of this with the, you know, especially the, the uber competitive schedule, and, you know, just different circumstances. So, ultimately, what is it you're going to be telling your players when it comes down to game time? Kind of get them motivated, get them ready for the long season ahead. I mean, every, you know, everywhere where we go, Ken, is um, we are going to have a target on our back. Um, especially in, in conference, we... We were able to win the conference for the for the last two years. Um, what is great, but that also means that um, wherever you go, every team you play, you always get um, their A game because um, you know we are the champion and people wanna people wanna be the champion. What is what is normal, and we just need to be ready for that. We have to be we have to we have to be able to play our A game every single time when we when we step on the field. And um, that is going to be the challenge this year to see if we can do that and really get to our full potential. And um, 
you know, get to that full potential every single time when we when we step on the field. But um, I'm that's that's what it's going to take. It's going to take um, a lot from us. Therefore, we're looking for a lot of leadership uh, from from within the team, and leadership comes from all different places. Um, it's not on the shoulders from the from the seniors or juniors. It's also our sophomores, and to be honest, like our freshmen who who we are excited about to to represent us. And um, we just got to find a way. Got to find a way to get to our full potential. All right. So, Coach, last question. As you already previously stated, that your second session of the day will be coming up shortly. What else do you have planned for the team within the next 12 days as far as preparing yourself for the season and getting ready for another rematch with Hofstra? Yeah, I mean, we will, you know, we practice. We practice today. Um, we're going to give the team off tomorrow to rest up a little bit. And um, and then next week, we will go into to two training sessions a day. Um, throughout the week, we will, the girls don't know that yet, but we will also do one training session on the beach. That is the plan to change it up a little bit, to send um, a little bit of different kind of view in uh, doing our training. So we will do that for one day. There will be... Um, some team bonding. The team is already very close with each other, but uh, you can always do it do a little bit more with that. Um, you know, maybe there's maybe there's a treat here or there. There is a, is a birthday coming up from from one of our players, McKenna. So you know, maybe we take the team and we actually get them ice cream or something like that. I, I know they like that, so maybe we maybe we do that. But uh, the overall goal, sec, is to. Um, um, just get better day by day, training session by training session, segment by segment, and um, hopefully just get better and better and get ready for for Hofstra for August 19th. It's another battle for a three-peat of America East titles, Coach. Thank you for joining us. So, thank you for joining us very much, and we hope that you and the team have a good next 12 days, and we hope that, and we hope that you have great luck in being able to start the 2021 fall season in 12 days. Sec Ken, appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. Have a good weekend, Coach. Thanks, guys. Okay. Tobias Bischoff, women's soccer coach here at Stony Brook. They kick off, literally, the fall season here at Stony Brook University. They'll do it on the road at Short Stadium in the blink of an eye. Guys, it's getting close. I mean, classes start last week in August, but the sports, they start very, very soon. Football is practicing, and we are going to be pretty busy. Now, of course, the the uh, actual schedule, the broadcast schedule, the football schedule is out, soccer schedule is out. You know when they're playing. Our broadcast schedule is still being worked on, and it will be on wsb.fm slash sports when it's ready. But, uh, Zach, you and Ken did a great job on the interview and a lot, a lot to look forward to because we plan on doing some soccer games to mix in with the American football games. A little bit of association football and American football. To listen to it, if they don't know any other way to do so. I'm sure that if they're not there to do it, then they would want to really have us do what we can to follow the team in every way possible. And we really do feel too, that ex, It's big too, especially with just getting more exposure for historian for programs, especially when they're on the uprise. Because the women's soccer team, especially the start of the decade, had a bit of a slump and really were the past five years were able to pick it up. And again, it's, it's well earned the recognition they're getting locally. And WSB broadcasters, it's our duty to continue to give that uh exposure and coverage to teams like women's soccer which are looking real strong and look like the early favorites to re to three-peat as america east champions i mean so far Tobias bischoff has really sorry tobias bischoff has really put together an excellent crew offensively defensively and in the net to really i think have a great shot at repeating and three-peating with his biggest challenger is going to probably going to be UMass Lowell and Binghamton. So it's going to be real fun to see and real fun to cover on WSBFL. Well, that is a fair 
estimation, I guess, uh, prediction on who could rival Sterling Brook for that America East title. You said that there, Ken, you get UMass Lowell, who were, pre- who were the top seed in the America East tournament, but like Sterling Brook in 2018, pretty much dropped the semifinals to a lower seed. And then you get Binghamton, who was also in that championship game with Sterling Brook. It was a one nothing win for the Seawolves. And, of course, it was pretty close, even though Sterling Brook scored early in that ninth minute, as we heard Tobias mention, thanks to Alyssa Francis from Fa- – actually, Fra- Fanny Golison from Alyssa Francis. But the fact that Francis and Chelsea DePonte are coming back for an extra year of eligibility, that is, of course, indeed what makes them, once again, that contender to win it all. And we've seen just – what this team has done, especially when, especially ever since Tobias Bischoff came to Stonybrook from Hofstra, which is pretty ironic, the fact that they've been playing each other each year now, not just because of the Long Island rival, but it's also because of Bischoff having those ties with Hofstra as being a head coach there before he went to Stonybrook. And who knows, maybe this will finally be the time eventually that Bischoff can probably give Stonybrook their first ever win against the Hofstra Pride. Me, I remind you, Stonybrook in women's soccer has never defeated Hofstra in their program history, dating back to their first ever game in 2001 in overtime at Hempstead. But we'll see eventually whether or not Bischoff can finally be the answer that will give this team the breakthrough against their cross-island rival. Okay. So, as we were saying... Our plan is to get that opening game at Hofstra on the air, wsb.fm slash sports for latest information, and we will try to bring you some more soccer action or association football action, whichever you like to call it. Uh, By the way, one thing I got a kick out of in the interview is that Coach Bischoff is a big fan of Bayern Munich, apparently. Yep, that's right. Yeah, so, I mean, everybody's got a favorite team, but it's very it's okay. very nice to, I mean, they're, they're of course, one of the uh, strongest teams, traditionally one of the strongest programs, and, of course, a European soccer team is a program, as we were saying. There's a women's team, there's an there's an under-19 team, there's the youth teams, they, it's, what they call the football club, it really is one. And that's something that you really don't – I mean, yes, you have minor league affiliates in baseball and stuff like that, but a system like that you don't really see in the States among the professional teams. It would be like the better. Yankees sponsoring a Little League team. <laughs> yeah, and you really can't get much better than Bayern Munich. Had a tremendous 2020 campaign, of winning the big three of championships, including the championship league. Mm-hmm. UEFA Champions League and, of course, the Bundesliga, uh, which they compete in. But in any case, it's always a good side story to talk about what they're doing, what they're up to next time we get them on. And that's going to happen soon, I'm sure, because yep. the well, – well, first of all, another person we have to get on very soon is Chuck Priori because football will be underway – September 2nd off the top of my head. Yep. And right. I will verify that because that will be yep. not just the season opener, but it will be the home opener. It's and that is day. against New Hampshire. And talking about an oddball in the schedule, remember I said off air that every now and then a team will get a conference game early. Well, you can't get much earlier than opening day. And that is a conference game against New Hampshire, Thursday, September 2nd, 6 p.m., 5.45 here on WSB. Yeah, I've seen how that played. I mean, like, the last time that Stony Brook, I think the last time that Stony Brook played its earliest a home game against their conference rival, the earliest, was probably back in 2015 in what turned out to be their official second game of the season against that same team in New Hampshire. Stonybrook was really dynamite against the Wildcats. I think it was a 31-9 to victory against UNH at that time. I remember mm-hmm. because that was That's... my first season, and 
Yeah, really, that's it was something just from that's, start to finish. Was... Yeah, and that's something that's really eluded Stony Brook for a, a long time, which is why I think it's a good thing they're starting off early against conference play because it has really been their Achilles' heel over the past couple of seasons. And I mean, just going just going over the last two seasons, I mean, they've had three wins in conference action, a lot more losses, double digits in losses, and even of those three wins, I mean, you're looking at two nail biters uh, over in the prior season those two victories and last year was really their first dominant win over a conference opponent in uh, quite a while so this is a team uh, slotted 10th in the conference coaches poll so clearly not one too many coaches see as really dominating this competition they got a big chip on their shoulder and a lot of folks they got to prove wrong yeah and after that first conference game of the season they got their next three against non-conference foes. One is, of course, up in Hamilton, up there against Colgate. And you get that cross-country trip against the Oregon Ducks, who are projected to win their Pac-12 conference. So who knows Probably how game. that's going to end up for Tony Brook in the end. But then you. back to reality of their own the week after in their non-conference finale at home against well, the Fort Rams. Is- We've come, we don't have a college preseason poll yet, do we? Not yet. Wait, what are you because, just, wait, wait, what do you mean? Like, what did you just say I'm about? talking no, about there's no FBS no poll. top 25. We don't have top 25 uh, yet. I think we're going to be getting that probably tomorrow. I think we're, yeah, actually, I heard that we're going well, to be getting a top 25 poll tomorrow. Oh, these are ESPN's power rankings. Of course, they have Alabama 1, Oklahoma 2, Clemson 3. No surprise there. What I'm looking for, there you go. Number 8, Oregon. Pac-12 champion last year. 2020, 4-3 record. Okay, 2021 preseason FPI 12. And they play Ohio State on September 11th, which is a big game for them. Even though it's yeah, not conference, the before, Stony that's a week before. Thank you very much. So, are we going to catch Oregon flat-footed? Probably not. But yeah, there's no way. I mean, <laughs> well, what's very interesting hard. is that this is probably probably like a little different of a quarterback situation that the Ducks would have imagined right at right before last season ended. They had this Tyler Chanel guy who apparently decided to transfer after the seat after their. Pac-12 season ended against Iowa State. So they need to rely on some other quarterbacks who apparently appear to be having some sort of rookie experience, if I'm not mistaken. Because I'm not really, still not completely certain. Like, well, I think the they're an Oregon case. Is there, believe they're, or not. they're pretty much their entire team is going to be five-star recruits at worst four stars. So, you know, their yeah, well, rookie is the equivalent uh, of someone who would wash the CAA in most cases. Well, I'm only starting to get into football mode myself. I mean, obviously, the the NFL training camps have started. And with when you're covering every single sport out there, and you guys, I'm sure, feel the same way, you basically take time off from one while you're concentrating on the other. So right now, I have to rev up my football here. So I'm going in blind on Oregon. But I don't have to worry about until September 18th. And same thing with you guys. But there's a fellow named Kayvon Thibodeau who heads into his junior year, apparently, with the potential to be the best player in college football. And we get to call him. And along with him, I see also that the Ducks have retained for another season C.J. Fridell, who was still at Oregon when Justin Herbert was there. And you yeah. gotta be very much, very much alert of his of how he establishes his running game. I, I don't know. I mean, like it's gonna be a question of whether or not C.J. Verdell is gonna log in a lot of yards against Stony Brook, or it depends on how long he'll stay in that he'll game play for a half until Oregon eventually slips away from Stony Brook for good. Like, you know how these games the work. Stony Brook will play him competitively in the first half. They'll pull away sit their starters, and it'll be a preseason game the rest of the rest of the way. Uh, I mean, look, you, you have to face reality. Now, of course, every now and then, as in you can count on one hand in your lifetime, 
my lifetime, maybe not even yours, that Appalachian State will take out of Michigan. We're not Appalachian State. Appalachian State is a very strong FCS program, and they knocked out, they they beat up a weak Michigan team. This is a top 10 team. Get out of it alive. But you know what? It puts us on the map. You get a nice trip to Nike U. I call it Nike U because it is literally the birthplace of Nike, Eugene, Oregon. And one of the founders of Nike was the track coach at Oregon. So, And they also have weird uniforms because Nike basically uses them as their, uh, their models. So Oregon has all of that going for them. And you know what? Definitely the biggest program we've ever played and again Kurt Hilton will correct me on it but I don't think he he will he will I believe that Oregon is the biggest program that this for our program excuse me has ever played yeah I think it's going to be highest bigger. rank no doubt yeah obviously bigger than Syracuse cuz this isn't like this isn't going to be Sunnybrook's first power five or Syracuse ever. football <laughs> sorry I mean yes known but not, not in a power conference. Well, the, uh, the ACC, the ACC is not a power conference in football. I'm sorry. They're a power conference in basketball, but they're not a power conference in football. I know somebody from the ACC is going to let me have it over that, but they're not the SEC. They're not the Pac-12. They're not the Big 12, and they're not the Big 10. They're not. Yeah, I mean, the last two teams in the ACC to look like powerhouses were, of course, Clemson. And Florida State. Florida now, State oh, wanted... thank you for mentioning Florida State. Yep, because Rest in peace, Bobby Bowden died at the age of 91. Put Florida State back on the map, an underperforming program before he took it over, and then became a juggernaut. So definitely Don't have to mention it. him. But the important thing here is that we are definitely – I mean, look, we we played FBS schools before, but we have not played a top 10 FBS school. And Oregon is a legit top 10 defending Pac-12 champion. You can't get much better than that unless you're playing Alabama. Yeah, we played, and believe it or not, Sunny Brook has played a top 25 team before in the past. That was back in 2017 when they played against South Florida. They were ranked number 22 at that time, and... To much to everybody's surprise, Stillingbrook was able to battle well with South Florida up until the fourth quarter, which you can definitely put down as a win for them in their playbooks. The rest of the season really told, really showed the reason why. They were made all the way to the second round of the playoffs in their own division. So... Who, who knows if it'll probably be the same thing. I mean, we're not really saying it this time because this is a power you know five what? ranked team this time. But still. Maybe I should cut the ACC some slack because they do have Clemson. And they do have North Carolina, who are legitimately strong uh, programs. But they also have Syracuse. They also have Boston College, who stink. So that's one of the reasons why I'm down on the ACC relative to the other power conferences. But in any case... Get a load of this. Remember Coastal Carolina? Now, you, know, you guys don't because you're, you guys got in after we left the Big South. But we were in the Big South Conference, and we played Coastal Carolina regularly. They're ranked 22nd in this ESPN preseason poll. How do you like that? Big South, we were competitive. It was us in Liberty that last game of the year to determine the champion every year. Maybe we're not so far away. So, Maybe. 10.50 here on the sports section. I'm Matt Mankiewicz, Zach Wilson, Ken Furman, Kerry Quinn hanging out with us her first time on the air at WSB. But we just talked to women's soccer coach Tobias Bischoff uh, we also need to mention, uh, as far as Stony Brook is concerned, the suspension of 
head baseball coach Matt Sank, the American East Conference announced, and this is really, really weird. I go to the AC, well, first of all, you Google it. If you Google Matt Sank suspended, the story comes up, AmericanEast.com. It's dated July 20th. It didn't happen on July 20th because when you click on it, the date's August 4th, which is this past week. So maybe they decided to do it July 20th and didn't announce it till August 4th. I don't know. only thing that really bothers me about it is that the incident for which Coach Sink is being suspended took place in May. What took him so long to hand down any kind of decision? What the hell happened here? I don't know why it would take that long. It's just... Well, you know what? The other thing we have to do is... That we have to. Which incident was it? <laughs> I'm actually... I, I, I'm having trouble remembering which... What was it that got him in trouble in the first place? Well, we know that it was his reaction pretty much poorly to how the conference and Amy Hutchhausen responded to okay so oh yeah yeah oh because there was another run-in with njit last time they played him in the regular season that really didn't it, it really didn't amount to much but there was but his react yes okay you want to know something though i guess they decided to give him the first nine games of the 2022 baseball season because as we were saying they're non-conference and they really this is where it gets really really tough because the way Matt Sank sets up his schedule is that he will take the team on a trip south to a warm weather area now i say south does not necessarily mean florida they play in georgia they play in south carolina they play in other parts of the south as well where the weather is more favorable to baseball in the middle of March, and they have indeed, you know, often gone up against some pretty big name schools and gotten beat up as a pro- as part of the process. They would come in with a three and six record, and it, everybody knew it really didn't matter much because what they were doing was number one, the coach was giving them a taste of that level of competition, and also trying to get them ready to play the conference schedule on an accelerated basis. So you play tougher teams. It Winning, you want to win naturally. But the winning really matters in the conference because they're not getting on at large. But they have to win the conference and conference tournament. Not so, But here's where it gets tricky. Of course, the baseball schedule is not yet being announced for next year. Without... Coach Sank, what are they going to do? This is something that I don't think they even they have an answer to, but it's something that will develop, I believe, over the winter. And it will be very interesting to see what happens here in terms of who gets scheduled, how things are done to open up the 2022 season with your head coach being suspended. Now, right. again... You don't, you don't... You don't see those things as a slap on the wrist because, you know, in the grand scheme of things, as you put it, it's really not. You know, this team, sure, it's likely Coach Sink will miss any conference playing time. However, again, this is your bread and butter in terms of preparing your team for conference action. And you're likely missing half of that non-conference slate, you know, due, due to being suspended. So... You know, just losing that perspective from being there in person, being able to go on those trips, train with those guys uh, right before the game, really get a grasp for, you know, the in-person uh, presence and things that go on then. You know, that's really going to be an edge that Sonnenberg's going to have to catch up on compared to the rest of the conference. And it's something where even though wins and losses don't matter, you're still – necessarily don't matter. You're still looking at the growth of some of these players who – where usually it gets sped up having that manager interact with you right there, you know, during during the weekend, gone. 
I think they're going to find a way to work around it. Whether or not they send video or they send a video crew down with the team, then stream it, it can be done. Or do something to make sure that that the coaching staff gets all the information they need. But, yeah, they're going to miss them down there. I really think so. And it will have an effect. But I don't understand. Again, here we are in the beginning of August that this decision gets handed down and, you know, whether, I don't know, maybe you're debating whether to cut uh, come some slack over the reaction because Stony Brook got the shaft. There's no doubt about it. They didn't get a chance to compete for an NCAA tournament bid, one that they could definitely have won on their home field, and it was all because of weather, and it was all because the schedule was butt up against Selection Sunday. And they had to have, for the NCAA, they had to have a verdict in, in other words. They had to have a champion. Whether the champion was declared or won it legitimately didn't matter as much. So what do they do to address that? I don't know. That was one of the, that uh, in, in my lifetime, and of course it's a, fairly long lifetime when you think consider it and hey you can go back to my grandparents lifetime you want to go back that far i can't think of a memorial day weekend where the weather was worse that was november weather it was horrible so it, literally once in a lifetime once in several lifetimes you have a weekend like that, that late in the year. But it conspired against Stony Brook, and Stony Brook has a lot of unfinished business, and they start a step behind because their coach is out for the first uh, nine games of the season. Not good. It is indeed an uncertain situation that the baseball team is facing, but... Of course, scheduling is not going to be an issue. It's just how they're going to be coached. Right, exactly. But does that influence? Well, I don't think it's going to influence it that much. I think they're going to schedule who they're going to schedule, probably because they've done it already. But I'm just wondering, over the past three months, what the hell was going on? Was... Was Matt saying, hang on, I, I got to talk to him. I, they had to stop in and talk to him, find out on record, off record, what the hell was going on here, why it took them to, well, it was the end of May, okay, that this whole mess happened, April, May 30th. So two full months and change for the American East to make up its mind what to do. It's ridiculous. It's really, indeed, ridiculous, as you said. I'm just really not going to be sure about how this will eventually. Well, well is- again, it's a matter of wait and see. And we're going to be concentrating on the fall and the spring, the fall and the winter and the spring in the meantime. But it is 10.59 and 42 seconds here on the sports section. This is WSB Stony Brook. I'm Matt Mankiewicz. Zach Wilson, Ken Firm, and Kerry Quinn with you till midnight. And, of course, because we are not physically in the studio, we can't take calls. But we can talk about a lot of things we think you're thinking about. And not the least of which is the contrasting fortunes of the New York Yankees and the New York Mets. A couple of weeks ago... It was the other way around. Tale of two cities, best of times, worst of times. But who's going to do the best of times and who's going to do the worst of times? The Yankees dropped one today, but there was an upside. They discovered they have another starter, one of their top prospects, a fellow who shares the same last name as a Spanish teacher in my high school, um, Senor Hill. Uh, he is... It's not given up a run yet 
in his first two starts. Now, of course, Yankees didn't score any runs today. So that kind of hurt. But the Mets, the Mets just got overtaken by Travis Jankowski and the Philadelphia Phillies. They went into the weekend in first place. Now they're in second, a couple of games out. Not insurmountable, but when you're not scoring runs and you're batting 167 with runners in scoring position, there's no place to go but down. Yeah, the Mets will trade the Yankees weekend for a hard view and it was regarding a loss. I mean, God, they played awful this week. I mean, it was hard to watch. It's, it's honestly incredible they actually managed to take a game from Miami, considering there really was no offense for a lot of the week. And, you know, it, it's tough. Yeah, they're losing. There's injuries definitely played a part in it. But at the same time, you had a game a couple nights ago. You got 15 guys on the and you really couldn't manage to drive in more than a run or two. I mean, there's really no excuse, especially this late in the season, for having bad hitting. Mets already fired one hitting coach. There's really no reason why they should be struggling this bad, again, this deep in the season. And really, a big part of that is a lot of the guys are going cold and pick the worst time to do it. You know, and that's taking out the injuries, like I said, of Lindor, Javi Baez, who probably just got hurt today. You know, yep. it's it, it's whatever can go wrong will go wrong for the Mets. It seems like, and it, it's gotten so bad that again, their odds, as you said, Matt, they were first place. Their odds going to the postseason at the start of the week was seventy seven percent. Now it's dropped well below forty three percent, and there's really no end in sight for the struggles this team has had. And again, it sucks to watch because this team is one of the worst. Offen- has one of the worst offenses in baseball. And even when they do score runs, they're not hitting, getting hits to score runs. Maybe they get a home run or two. But really, it's been through walks, hit by pitches, wild pitches, etc. You know, they're really... You know, you, I don't know what team is worse for batting their hands than the Mets. It would have been the Yankees up until about a week ago when all their trade moves really woke that offense up, Matt. You know what, though? What really adds insult to injury? Who pitched and shut out the Mets today? All right, that would be Zach Wheeler, former New York. Thank you very much. Freaking karma that apparently caught up with the Mets because of how Matt Harvey and Zach Wheeler. Do you believe this? <laughs> okay, I'm not sure about Matt Harvey, but Zach Wheeler, yeah. Matt, yeah, my already's had his struggles, but as you said, Zach Wheeler, and again, it is like a ghost because the Mets had a chance to sign him uh, during the old Wilpon era, and they opted not to. And as we saw here, coming back to bite him in time, they really can't afford it. So he says he wanted to pitch like Doc, as in Doc Gooden. My God, no Holiday. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was. Uh, they retired. See, he's in Philly now. Good. Yeah, that's right. It was a great gesture, I, I gotta say. Yeah, and yeah. But he, yeah, he they retired his number. Uh, the Phillies did. Yeah, but try to pitch like Doc. But you know what? Old New Yorker, and I see Doc. I see. I think good, not Doc Holiday. Holiday. He's you know, Holiday was a guy who, when he was with the Jays, yeah, we dreaded as Yankee fans. Because you penciled in the loss, you know you'll, they'll take two out of three. But the game you pit, you get against Halliday, you'd lose. But in any case, the Zach Wheeler blanks the Mets. The Mets are stinking up the joint right now. And let's just look at the standings, because all year long you've been looking at the Mets on the top. The Mets are one game over five hundred. They've lost eight of their last ten. They've lost four in a row. Philadelphia's won eight in a row. Now, let's be fair here. Okay, they're two and a half out because Philly's over only six over five hundred. They're not that great either. Okay, all these teams stink on the road. Now, Atlanta, at least they have a balanced record. 
They're one game over 500 at home and one game over 500 on the road. But uh, take a look at this: the, the the runs scored versus runs against. I love this column. First of all, Atlanta is the only team in the National League East that has a positive differential for and against. Even Philadelphia is minus five. The Mets are minus 18. But Philadelphia has scored 518 runs and the Mets 416, 100 more runs. I mean, they've also given up nearly 100 more runs. But that tells you something. The Mets have given up amongst the fewest runs in baseball. Okay, the teams in the National League that have given up fewer runs than the Mets are Milwaukee, first place. San Francisco, first place. Best team in baseball, 30 games over 500, something they never achieved in their championship years, the three, three World Series they won. The Dodgers, right behind them. At 67 and 45, 22 over. Okay? Those are the teams that have allowed fewer runs than the New York Mets because the Mets hitting is so bad. Now let's look at the teams who have scored fewer runs than the Mets in the National League. Let's keep it to the National League right now. 416 runs. Pittsburgh, 405. 30 under, 41 and 71. They've given up 175 more runs than they've scored. Oh, my God. And guess what? In the National League, that's it. Now, in the American League, nobody. Nobody, even the worst team, even the Baltimore Orioles, who have given them 624 runs, by the way. Their pitching is abysmal, and that's why they stink. But that tells you a huge... That's basically your story, that the Mets are the second-worst offense in baseball, and they're still one game over five hundred on their pitching. Yeah, it, it is incredible. And now is really when it's going to come to bite them. Again, you got your ace, Jacob the Rob. He's not coming back till September as a result of it. It doesn't matter. They have trouble scoring runs for him. He won a Cy Young Award with a 10 and 8 record. Oh, oh I'm, I'm aware. And it, again, it's really quite, it's really, I would say mind blowing. But, you know, when you follow the Mets, it really isn't. <laughs> where you make your deadline acquisitions and you pick up a defensive first player in Javi Baez, who, great defender, but with the exception of that home run he hit uh, his first day in, really didn't produce much for the Mets offense. You know, you Defense really isn't your first... problem. Yeah, the Yankees exactly. had defensive really... problems, and yeah. they are, they've improved as a result because they shored up their defense. I was because the two Italian ends. guys are great defenders. I was going to say, they improved on both ends, getting a great Gallo and Rizzo. offensive and defensive uh, hitters in Gallo and Rizzo, as you said. The Mets did the complete opposite. They win defense and are likely going to be missing out on that defensive pickup in Javi Baez. So essentially, they went into the deadline and got new pitching, which hasn't really worked out for them in the most part, got no bats, and your key players like Pete Alonso are slugging. So now you got no one to help them up on top of missing Lindor. Michael Conforto gone missing the entire season and producing nothing on a contract year, mind you. And, you know, the expectation that they're, they're down two games, but the way they're playing, they're going to be down 10 by the end of next week. Okay. Well, first of all, as we said, as I said at the beginning of the show, all streaks end, even losing streaks. So hopefully, and then we'll take a look at the uh, Mets' upcoming schedule because they do come back home, and well, they hopefully they'll get a they, little bit, bit of a break here because they, they are they have they are a- the Moribund Nationals. This is the time this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that they have to start turning things around 
because then the Dodgers come to town. They then have, they, they go to them. San Francisco and then L.A. First of all, <laughs> and then the Giants come the back Vikings, to town. Back to San Fran, the two right. best teams in baseball. Yeah. Both of them was, can score runs by the barrel. This but was the, the Mets sweet. can outpitch them. Yeah, but even then, this was the Mets week to to really you know close the door on any NOE's teams coming back. You know, this was their time for them to really shut down the rest of the division, and they didn't do that. And now, no, Marlins they, took two out of three, and Philly swept them. Three out of four, uh, three out of four, the Marlins took. Yeah. yeah. So is, this, this is team insane is going down fast. But yeah, here's the ironic thing: changes fast. Well, first of all. August, it's a tradition with, I think, with National League East teams in general, but as far as we're concerned, the Mets, is that the Giants and Dodgers come to town and they go out to play them in August. The West Coast teams come in every August. It's right around that this time. You know, if you want to get tickets to see, watch them play the Dodgers or the Giants, you know they're going to be there in August. So. Which also means you know, a lot of fun to watch. You get to see these teams. That's but true. you're looking at this with dread right now because the Nationals, you should be able to stomp on no matter how badly you're hitting because they blew up their team with the deadline. The Nationals are playing out their strength. Even then when they still had that team, they took two out of three from the Mets last time they were at Washington. So <laughs> Right. So yeah, even that's not a guarantee. That but yep. all streaks end, and maybe this little homestand with the Nationals and the Dodgers, and then this West Coast swing with the Giants and the Dodgers, and the Giants back home and the Nationals, and they finish out the month against the Marlins. So, uh, it, it's life is rough being a Met fan because because your offense is so bad that you can't pencil wins in. I mean, you can't even do it with DeGrom because DeGrom will lose one nothing. Now, we apply the same formula to the Yankees. Okay, Yankees, you know, like I said, all winning streaks end, and the Yankees had a nice one going. Okay, fine. But Lewis Heel is a find. And the Yankees, talk about a team that's been getting effective pitching from... You know how in college baseball, how coaches will run out the bullpen or you know, a, or a freshman or somebody like that for the midweek non-conference game, see what he's got. Well, the Yankees have been doing that for the past week and winning. They are six and a half out of first place. They are two and a half behind the Red Sox, and the Red Sox have tanked, and let's do the runs for, runs against formula again. Tampa Bay is scoring runs, and only Houston is scoring more than they are. Okay, okay, Toronto has scored one more run than they did. 571 versus 570, but the only one over that is Houston with 604. Houston's in the West. They're 20 over 500, but they're still only two games in front of Oakland. And everybody's chasing Oakland for the wild card. So, Tampa Bay is right now in front. They've won four in a row, and they've beaten up on Boston. They've beaten, and they they go to Boston on Tuesday. So, let them beat up each other. Yankees, first of all, they will be playing in Kansas City tomorrow, but the runs for runs against. Tampa Bay vaunted pitching, right? They've given up only two more runs than the Yankees have. Yankees have the stingiest pitching in the American League East at 447 runs allowed. Baltimore has worst anywhere at 624. Yankees at 447, Toronto 448, Tampa Bay 449. So the pitching staffs are roughly equal. Boston has scored... 551 runs, Tampa Bay scored 570, and the Yankees 462, and they're 11 over 500. That's amazing. 
It That's is. what the Mets should be doing. <laughs> Agreed. Okay. Uh, okay go Their back to the run differential theory. is only plus 15. Tampa Bay's is plus 121. Yep. As is the Chicago Ended. White Sox. They're in first place. Ten and a half up on yep. Cleveland. Cleveland is minus 31 and a game, more, and a game under 500. So Toronto plus 123. So again... You have teams in this division that can out hit the Yankees by over a hundred runs at this stage of the season. And the Yankees are sticking with them. And you know, Roldis Chapman's on the injured list. And the Yankees have also had a COVID nineteen bug ravaging because they got two their, their top two pitchers knocked out. Uh, their third pitcher is physically injured. Well, they're fi- you know what I mean. Yes. Skeletal injury rather than COVID. And they're relying on a prospect at AAA, Luis Hill, and who's going to be turn out to be a find, I think. He's going to work his I way agree. into the rotation permanently. And we shall see how that breaks down because with the Yankee schedule – you got to be happy with what you see. Because. Again, go back to the Subway series. The Yankees were virtually dead to rights. Yeah, they were both five runners, but that team was falling at fast. If it wasn't that the series, Yankees it was the one right after. They were, were well perilously out close to finishing that weekend under 500. That's right. They were one game, I believe. One game above 500. And. And you look at the response afterwards. This team restocked and reloaded and is working. And even better, they're finding new guys to fill in for those that are out, those that are injured. As you said, the aforementioned Louis Skill. Add Steven Writings as well. He had a great showing up against Baltimore, uh, I believe it was Tuesday or earlier this week. I mean, the both of them were lights out against a already bad Baltimore team. I got the job done to get them a win. And that's really been a big key for the Yankees team is that the next man has stepped up time in and time out. And they are producing, you know, a little through the lineup when guys are out. And there's so many new names that you really wouldn't expect to step up. And they have found ways to do it. And that's been a big reason why they have really dominated over the last month. And even that's then, that's baseball saw, out of the break. Yeah, that's right. I think them and Tampa Bay are one and two in terms of. Uh, records following the All-Star game. And the, for the Yankees, they lost today, but they still managed to win their last eight series. So you're taking two out of three or three out of four on every series consecutively. You know, that is a recipe for getting back into the race, which the Yankees are doing. And even then, when, again, they got guys out. We saw Andrew Heaney earlier this week, a newcomer from uh, Los Angeles for the Yankees. He pitched deep enough to where he was able to reserve the bullpen, which worked hard Friday night. And the Yankees, remember, the Yankees used nine relievers in that 3-2 extra ratings win. And they were able to win yesterday for, for as I said, their eighth consecutive series win. This is a team that, again, is on fire right now. They're the hottest team in baseball. And it's just mind-boggling seeing them acknowledge the mistakes, acknowledge their struggles, and correct them. And again, see other teams like again the Mets, where you have you see the holes, and instead of responding to them, you do the complete opposite and do virtually nothing. And again, see the results and see your lead dwindle. While the Yankees find a way to get back into the playoff race again, I mean, it not is only it is just incredible to watch. Do you not address your needs, but you address things you don't need? You your strengths. I don't get it. That's right. Yeah. And then, you're, and then you're, again, you're, you're adding to your you strengths lose. instead of dealing with your weaknesses. And then you lose your strengths to injury or it's to slumps. As we said, Pete Alonso on a slump, DeGrom out, et cetera, et cetera. For the Yankees, yeah, they lost Chapman. But to me, that's a blessing in disguise considering how bad he was struggling right before the break. And you got Jonathan Loisica, who is a tremendous a reliever filling in in the closer position. And he was able to get the job done. I believe it was in yesterday's win. So mm-hmm. the Yankees, they, they are rolling again, despite the loss. And a part of the reason again, is going to be Anthony Rizzo. Him missing time is going to impact 
team. They're going to lose a bit of that offense. But they've shown, having Luke Voigt return it as well, you know, they've shown they're going to be able to have that next man up mentality and have it work to success. This is a team that, again, I thought they were dead to right to Mofugo. They got a real good shot at finding a way to fighting their way into the playoff spot, probably a wild card position. Well, the division's still within reach. They have three Kansas City starting tomorrow night, and then they move on to Chicago to take on the White Sox. They have an odd, well, because of the Field of Dreams game, because they're going from uh, Missouri to Iowa, which is obviously a shorter trip, that's going to be played on Thursday, the 12th, and then they get a day off, and then they get two more in Chicago. So then they come home on the 16th. They have a makeup game against the Angels, doubleheader against the Red Sox, a, a day-nighter, and, a, and another game against the Red Sox, and then four against the Twins. And then and again, as you said, a lot of those teams, those are in great teams. The Twins last in the AL Central, the Royals fourth in the AL Central, and it's really only a couple of losses separating those two apart. They're virtually dead last in the AL Central and third and fourth behind Baltimore and Texas overall. But the White Sox the are AL. good. White Sox are good, and they've been struggling. The Angels can't pitch. As of late. No, Angels can hit, but that's can't pitch. Their heel. Yeah, they're at five hundred. Yeah. Yeah, but that's why. Because yeah. when you're going up against the Houston's and the Oaklands of the world, they and can the pitch and you Dodgers. can't. And like Dodgers, like today, where they held the Angels to two runs while the Angels gave up eight. Well, then you finish out August in a very interesting fashion. Two in Atlanta, but then four in Oakland. And then you get the Angels to finish out the month. The That trip... Oakland and uh, and Anaheim. That's another one. You know, the Mets get the Dodgers and Giants, and the Yankees get the A's and and uh, the Angels. And it's no matter how good a Yankee team is, they always struggle out there. They always struggle in Oakland. They definitely struggle in Anaheim. In 1998. When the Yankees dominated, 114 wins, all that wonderful stuff, there was one team that had a winning record against them, the Angels. How do you like that? But it, they were notorious. Go out to Anaheim, and it, that doesn't matter. With 10 in a row, go to Anaheim and die. That's it. That's the thing that scares me the most, is that no matter how much the Angels are struggling, the Yankees will have trouble with them when they go out there. So August is is that that schedule, except for the you know, a little bit of a break with the Royals and the Twins, is pretty tough. But I think this team, and Aaron Boone mentioned it over the past couple of days, and I've been except for today because I tried to stay away from the rain. Uh, I was at the game. I was at the ballpark all week. And you're seeing that the adversity that this team faced seems to have toughened them a little bit. And also the fact that Chapman's on the IL. Because Chapman, even when he was out there, the last time, last save he had, a ball was caught at the left field wall. Okay? So he still has that little thing in him, whatever it is. He's not back to the start of the season. That's right. It's like, you know, if he doesn't kill you now, he'll kill you later. I wanted to deal him with the deadline so bad. I, 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 I've been down on Chapman. Look, it, no one was going to replace Mariano Rivera, okay? During Mariano Rivera's career, there were good closers, but they were good for a couple of years, Okay. Mariano Rivera was in a class by himself because even Trevor Hoffman was not as good. Bruce Suter, all Lee Smith, all these guys who were in the hall were not Mariano Rivera. The Yankees had something that nobody else had for longer than nobody had. 
I mean, Eric Gagne was good for the Dodgers for a little while. The Red Sox, every championship they won at, since 2004 was with a different closer. Folk, Papel, Bond, Kimbrell, whoever the hell they could find. But all of them were good closers, but none of them for the length of time that Mo was. So I get that. Chapman, well, what's Chapman done for them? Killed their season twice in a row. Nearly killed their season this year. Fortunately, it was too early for that to happen. I still think that somewhere down the road, whether it's in the postseason, whether it's in the regular season, Chapman's going to blow a save and it's going to kill the Yankees. Crickets. I mean, it's already happened, so... <laughs> I mean, it's not it's like already, it's yeah. necessarily a, a reach. It's happened twice. And even though the yeah, first time... in yeah. a row. I, yeah. was, you know what? Sometimes, look, this is the type of thing the Cashman will never go on record. He can't. He can't throw his guys under the bus. But privately, you have to ask him, why is he still here? And you'll get the answer because there's nobody out there who's better. Zach Britton is better. Chad Green is ago. better. You don't. There's no out there. They're right here. Right. Again, Rongs isn't really a guy I care too much about. A lot of off-field incidents, which really rubbed me the wrong way. As for me, again, to me, there's no loss for the Yankees not having him out there. He's got 23 saves on the season, sure. But, again, even really once we saw the sticky stuff uh, taken out of the game for the most part, you know, Chapman has been a shell of himself and really hasn't looked like a major league. And again, to be upstaged by some of these other relievers really goes to show there's not much out there, you know, take when you take out that 103 mile per hour fastball. And even then, again, he's not the same guy he was on that Cubs team because now the players are hitting it and they are launching it out of the ballpark. You take well, back to Alonzo's. During that, uh, an argument's been July made that weekend. Joe Madden overused him in that run, and he's never been the same since. Yeah, and again, even so, you know, this for the Yankees, the success they're not going to find success, you know, by continuing to go to him. We've seen this team evolve by turning to new players and seeing new pieces really fill up this roster. Gallo, Rizzo, as we said, Alfred mentioned, but again, even some of their. Uh, prospects and rookies like, like that for mentioned Gill have gotten the job done for this Yankees team. And I think that's going to be their key to success going forward is just seeing all of these new pieces step in and step up to those big roles. The other and thing they got a great job. They got a great job to do it. as I said, against a couple of struggling teams like uh, Kansas city, as we said, so where they could continue adding on to their series win streak and potentially get to 9 or 10 before you get that big series against Chicago, Matt. You know what else? And this is something I mentioned earlier, but really need to stress now, is that when you're getting the pitching, obviously you need to have people catch the ball, and the Yankees were criticized heavily for that. They are making a ton of errors before the deadline. Gallo and Rizzo even beyond their offensive contributions, really shore up the Yankees defensively. And that shows up when a run gets taken off the board when Rizzo throws a guy out at the plate. Was it Rizzo? No, it was, Gall it was Gallo. 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 Rizzo was out. Gallo. Gallo threw him out. And Gallo wasn't expected to be the big contributor that like Rizzo's been. Rizzo's out with COVID, but but the whole point remains is that they're getting that little edge defensively can turn a game around or keep it from turning around, even more importantly, that if a ball gets hit into the left field corner, it's more likely to get caught now. That makes a huge yeah. difference. <laughs> I mean, we saw that, that save the role of Chapman's game. bacon the other day. That's true. That was, that was my point. We saw it the other day with Gallo making an incredible diving lead out in left field to uh, prevent. Uh, I mean, not in that particular time, but to prevent 
a run from coming across the board. And ultimately, the Yankees won that game. You know, we're seeing this team, and this team, mind you, was really a bottom five, bottom ten, statistically wise. Looking at the the ratings, they were mm-hmm. among the lower third. Now they're at least in the middle of the pack when it comes to defensive statistics. So it's been right. evident that adding Rizzo, adding Gallo, has really raised this team. And again, what are the Mets thinking? What's Sandy Alderson thinking? The strategy was all wrong. Your pitching's fine. Your defense is fine. You give a fewer runs than just about everybody. But you don't score runs, and the only team that scores fewer runs than you do is 40 games under 500. What does that tell you? I know they're in the hot seat right now, but um, I think they were playing pretty well early in the season. And they as were. a Met fan myself, um, we try not to get overly excited until we get to the end of September. But oh yeah, um, the Mets have been here before, and unfortunately, they're collapsing. But I'm still holding on to hope. <laughs> well, there's is, no reason not to. They're still in it. The only problem is they can't let this go on much longer. And hopefully, return home will help turn the bats around. Because on paper... This team should be performing a lot better. Conforto has had Maybe much better should... years. Alonzo's had they... much better years. Run down the list. Yeah, I was saying on paper, this team should be about nine games above 500, as opposed to, I think, just nine. one or at 500. They should, be, yeah, uh, they should be ahead in the division by double digits. Yeah, yeah they should that's, that's probably at Miami. They should have at least gotten one win against Philadelphia, uh, not two at the very least. That's exactly that's what point, should have happened. Three or four and two or three against Miami and Philadelphia this past week. They should have I had agree. that. They it's should be the where the Chicago down. White Sox are. Chicago White Sox are 20 over 500 and 10 and a half up on Cleveland, who's a game under. Your National League East counterparts are hovering around 500. So are they right now. But if they were hitting better. They could be 20 over. But the whole point remains is that, and I was saying this all along, even before Washington blew it up, all these teams, with the obvious exception of Miami, were treading water in the first half of the season. And that's why the the, the Mets were ahead, that they were able to deal with their struggles because their pitching was so good, it covered for a multitude of sins. But now, Atlanta's starting to heat up. Philly, you've seen what they've been able to do. By the way, Travis Jankowski's become a big contributor for them. Well, at least that's that this weekend against the Mets. Him being a <laughs> former Seawolf with the baseball yeah. team. Travis Jankowski, <laughs> folks, you know who he is. Come on, you got to know him by now. Class of 2012. Member of the College World Series team, starting center fielder thereon, has been bouncing around the majors for the past few years, originally drafted by the Padres. His basic game is, covers a lot of ground in center field, has speed. His bat has had trouble catching up to major league pitching in his earlier years, but it seems like it has finally time. now. He, he's hitting a career high, 264, and on top of that, slashing 264, 354, uh, sorry, uh, 356, 710, with an o- OPS plus 96. This man is producing, and exactly. he doesn't necessarily get on base too often, but when he does, he's driving in. He's either driving in runners or getting himself in scoring position to score runs. Exactly. And that is his game. He was never, I mean, he, he had power when he was with Stony Brook. He wasn't supposed to be the power guy. He was the all-around guy on that team. Probably the best all-around position player on a team that went to the College World Series. So you could tell. And he is, right now, of that class, of that College World Series team, the only one currently in the majors. But, look, if there's an upside, we'll always be looking for an upside. If the Mets continue to falter and Philly runs away with the division, at least we get to see Travis Jankowski in the postseason. Okay, we'll take that. Philly's uniform. 
Nice yeah. little compensation. That's well, consolation. It is. Well, if you what? Well, hey, we're we want the Mets to succeed, and like everybody else, we are frustrated when the front office and this has been happening. It happened under the Will Ponds. It's happening under the current ownership. When the front office is not making the right moves to make the team better. And then you look at the heat that Cashman was facing in the first half of the season when the Yankees were struggling, and he pulls a rabbit out of a hat again at the trade deadline. Yankees are playing better. Still a lot of baseball left. We still don't know how things are going to break down. But he did something, and the something he did had an effect. This is why... He's been the Yankee general manager since 1998. That's 23 years, guys. I don't think, and this is where I have to start looking, Ed Barrow and George Weiss. Ed Barrow is an old Yankee general manager who signed Lou Gehrig way back when, died in 1953. He has a huge plaque in Monument Park. He was the Yankee general manager from 1920 to 1945, which means he also oversaw the transaction for Babe Ruth. But 1920 to 1945, you know how much the Yankees won back then. 11 times World Series champion, Monument Park honoree. So he's been, he was Yankee general manager longer than Cashman has. Now, George Weiss. George Weiss was the guy who I believe took over from him. And Weiss is also in the, both are in the Hall of Fame, by the way. And Weiss joined the Yankees as the farm system director in 1932. Became general manager uh, in 40, hold on, 48, I believe. And then he left... In 1961, I believe, because he became general manager of the Mets, the first GM of the Mets. So he helped build the 69 team. But it was actually Bing Devine who had more to do with that. But, again, that's baseball history for you. But 23 years in that job, which is one of the hottest seats in baseball. I'm not talking about Yankee general manager these days because Hal is not George. But what I'm saying is, in any team, I mean, look at John Schurholz, okay, who was a longtime GM of the Braves, and he was a guy who put together Max Smoltz and Glavin and Chipper Jones and all those other great teams. Okay, Schurholz. Um, 1990 to 2007, so there you go. That's only 17 years. But he had a huge impact on that team. And he then was also GM of the KC Royals when they won the World Series in 85, so 81 to 90. There you go. And he later on took over. After he was GM, he became president of the Braves and stayed in that job until 2016. There you go. But there's a guy who had a long career, too, as a GM and considered one of the great ones. And he's in the Hall of Fame as well. There you go. But that's why Brian Cashman has had his job for as long as he has. I think for the Mets to get on the same level as the Yankees, they just need for someone to get hot and start carrying the team down the stretch, and then I think they'll start pitching the way they did early in the season. And I think anything well, can happen for them. The guys are there. It's tougher, though. It is tougher, though. Again, you're missing the Grom. You're relying a lot more on Stroman. Uh, you're hopefully having a Carrasco back long-term. Uh, as we said, Walker as well. But even after that, you know, Rich Hill, he's gotten rocked. Really, last start more than his first one. But it's 10 innings, he's given up seven runs. And he wasn't producing that well on his prior team as well this season. But it's really looking like this trade isn't paying off. You got Pete Alonso again, 0 for 20. You got a lot of guys on that Mets lineup. You go up and down where they really aren't producing. With the exception of Nemo, I can't really tell you who's been really lining up for New York for the past couple weeks. And, this and again, past a lot of this week. falls on Sandy. 
Sandy Alderson. Because, again, this is a guy, as week. we said, they needed offense, traded for a defensive guy in Javi Baez, who's out. Rom's out now. And even before that, you go look at Rocker Kumar, their first, uh, first, their first round draft pick. They ended up, forget not signing him. They didn't even offer him a contract. They just picked the guy and let him wait out until the signing time expired and to get a pick for next year's draft. I mean, how do you not even look into the guy and offer him a potential contract, even if it's less money than expected, off hearsay that he may have an injured arm? I mean, there are problems up there. And well, Keith Cohen's got to fix it if he wants to play the big problem. If he wants to own a playoff team. Here we go. Since we were last on air last Sunday, August 1st, these are the number of runs the Mets scored every day, and they played every day, including today. One, three, four, five. They won that game. Two, two, three, zero. The one they scored five, they won. They lost all the rest. It's step you're not, I don't care guys. if you if you could <laughs> run Degrom out there every day. You're not going to win scoring the runs like that. True. The problem the is not wins. your pitching. The pitching, yes, day to day, we are going to have the rotation like the Yankees have had. Yes, I, I do agree with that. But the hitting and guillotining your pitching coach is not the answer. Adding a bat. Because hitting is contagious. What? You get somebody, you get a Rizzo or a Gallo or both. Somebody like them doesn't have, didn't have to be them, but something to provide a spark to the lineup. Maybe well, Lindor is he coming back? I don't know. Not for not for a couple not, weeks. Yeah. Well. It's it, Noel is not lost. <laughs> if they can tread water until Lindor comes back, Lindor is capable of providing that spark. That's what he was signed for. Has not done it. I mean, you, yeah. I was going to say even, even then, it took him a while. It took him really, literally, right before he got hurt for him to really wake up offensively. I mean, right. <laughs> even then, you know, it's not just him. You got to honestly, you can't trade anymore. So you really got to look at those minor leaguers like the Billy McKinney's. To well, what the Yankees do? Team. Yankees brought up minor leaguers. Okay. Taking a look at, I mean, they talk about the guys they brought up, the kids they brought up. Okay. Look what they were able to do with these guys. Okay. Where you just pull people up out of nowhere. But were you, uh, you know, where is he? Since, well, was it since the break? Oh, prior to the break, the Yankees stole 18 bases. Since then, they've stolen at least uh, the 20. Or is it, actually, it's not quite as far back as that. Over the past couple of weeks, I believe. I mean, it was a, a stat that was brought up during the game broadcast on Yes, that during that stretch where the Yankees actually exceeded their stolen base total for the rest of the year, that's the most in baseball. What does that tell you? I just think it's sad that there's a possibility this best team can go 4 and 37 and find a way to be among the top five in next year that will be draft. As opposed to being, as I said, 10 plus games above 500 and securing, locking up a playoff spot. I mean, at that point, you got to retool the roster at that point because you know, there's no no going backwards this group. I'm thinking about Greg Allen. Okay. He's back. He gets sent back down. But Allen, when he was up here, woke the team up. So, again, you got to try. You got to look. 
when Lindor went down, somebody had to come up, and they need somebody to just make things happen because that offense is basically nine zombies in the lineup. It's out there right. That's that's the fact of the matter. They are they're dead in the water every day in, a day in and day out. He said. But there you go. We got, let's see, it's 11.46, and we haven't even talked about NFL football yet. But really, what's been going on in the camps that have uh, drawn that has drawn your attention? First preseason game is later this week, is it not? Yep, next weekend. So, anything you're looking forward to? Because, again, I'm still not in football mode. Well, to me, I'm as far as the Giants, it's hard to see what you're kind of expecting because Kenny Galladay, he's out for like about a week or two after that lingering hamstring issue that he had this past week in Giants training camp. But Ken, I don't know if you – Ken, I'm sure that you got this down, but we need to go over what happened with the Giants this past week oh, in yes. one of the training camp sessions. Like it was a fight going on at Quetz Diagnostics Training Center, and Daniel Jones apparently was in the bottom of it, but he revealed that it was intentional to stay with his teammates to, like, show that type of intensity, and even though Joe Judge was not happy about it one single bit, seeing his teammates fight amongst each other, that is not what creates team... That is not what creates chemistry within a team. Yeah, well, we'll take the good and the bad. I think, obviously, as you said, the infighting going on, bad. Uh, it's not what you want to see. But uh, to try to look on the bright side, you it's two sides trying to raise their competitive nature. And that's something you can at very least respect, you know, offensive and offensively and defensively. You know, really just players standing up for each other. I mean, the incident started because Evan Ingram retaliated after uh, Corey Clement gave – uh, hit Evan Ingram after the whistle was blown and then you saw Logan Ryan come in and he shoved Ingram from behind and then the rest of the team uh, jumped into the scrum so you know on that front that's really not what you want to see from your players however the good thing is you do want to see them sticking up for each other so at least you know offensively they got their players back vice versa defensively Daniel Jones you don't want to see your quarterback get involved in the scrum especially not at the bottom but in terms of team chemistry, that was probably the best thing that he could have done because besides the leadership of caring for his guys, caring for his offense, getting involved in it, he goes there to show that he really doesn't see himself as above the team in the sense of he's staying away from the action when it spontaneously occurs. He is getting in there, even if maybe it's not for the best for the fans or for the coaches, He's getting in there, and he's fighting for his guys and backing them up. And for a third-year quarterback, really two-and-a-half-ish, because he wasn't a starter until midway through his rookie season, to do that, I think that shows a lot of maturity, which he's already had coming out of Duke, and leadership qualities, which were questioned a bit uh, last season. But at the same time, again, the bad Joe Judge stopping practice, they did laps, did sprints, but for the most part, the guys really aren't complaining too much about it. The Giants have had four or five retirees, but no one that could really make an impact on the team or the starting roster. I mean, Kelvin Benjamin was the first guy to, to call it quits, and he's a guy who, outside of a spectacular season with Cam Newton, hasn't amounted to much and, quite frankly, has shown he's not willing to put in the effort to adjust or adapt to other teams and their styles. Okay, Coach Judge wanted... Kelvin Benjamin at, I believe, 235. Benjamin came in at about 260. So or first day in, he didn't even make it the full day. So that's that's a release I really can't blame Joe Judge for. But, yeah, a team that there's a lot of questions. They have the potential to be really good. Uh, there's, I think, still a lot more questions remaining through their first week of training camp. I'm sure you'd agree with that, Zach. Yeah, I mean, with what Joe Judge did in response to what happened with his teammates during that scuffle. I think that really shows the the type of discipline 
that the Giants are looking for in a head coach because you need, you need because this is what the Giants really need after the last few seasons before Judge have not really gone their way. Ben McAdoo after that 2016 season with the Giants just flat it's out miserable. In it sucks. You could say it, it sucks. In the two years that the Giants had with Pat Shermer as head coach, no. it just didn't seem to click anywhere. No. Just couldn't be as tough as how the Cowboys were, how the Eagles were at the time. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're right. And, and again, it goes to show, too, you know, the toughness from the coaching, Matt, as you witnessed. Tough coaches lead the Giants to success. Saw it in the 80s with Will Parcells. Saw it in the late 2000s, sure. early 2010s under Tom Coff. Well, here's yeah. another thing is that who was it? Again, drawing a blank. Uh, somebody threw Joe Judge under the bus that he said the team will never succeed because of Judge's ego. Yeah. Kelvin Mitchell. Yeah. Yep. Although he so, really hasn't accomplished much outside of one good season, which you could credit Cam Newton for. Right. So, interesting thing about what the Jets are doing right now with uh, the other Zach Wilson. And is that there? there's no competition for the job. It's his. And what they're trying to do, instead of using seven-on-sevens in practice, they're, they're trying to do 11-on-11 and try to expose him to as many pressure situations in practice as they possibly can. They're trying to ramp him up to the NFL style of play. Ask anybody, any rookie in particular, and the first thing they will tell you that the big difference between the NFL versus college is the speed at which everything happens. And that is the main adjustment that college players have to make in order to see in the NFL. So, given that, will he be ready? They're trying. They're trying to get him ready for the regular season. As we said, August 14th is Jets-Giants' first preseason game. It's going fast. Uh, I mean, the, the preseason, it, it's always seemed to be long and interminable. And so by the time the re- regular season started, it was kind of a relief. doesn't seem that way anymore. It's happening fast. But the funny thing is, I don't know. Uh, it's just the vibe I get or maybe because I'm just so consumed with baseball right now, is that the training camps don't seem to be attracting or making as many headlines as they would normally do right around now. Is that my imagination? Am I wrong? I think the timeliness of it has something to do with it again. You're in the heart of baseball. Olympics have really overtaken a lot of... Speaking of which, we have a few minutes on that, too. Yeah, as I said, seeing again, seeing the storylines like Simone Biles play out, her return, ultimately winning that bronze medal, proving she was the best uh, gymnastics Olympian in the world. Seeing other... Seeing America win the most medals with 39 gold medals. And And seeing the women win more than the men. Yeah, that's right. The women's side, seeing Diana, Tracy, and Sue Bird become the most decorated medalist in basketball. Kevin Durant putting America on his back for a big win over France. And uh, After you know, losing that's, really, to I think, that's right. It was a great comeback story from them. And I think that's really taken over the headlines. And for football, we'll really start to see them really become center stage once again, once the regular season starts. But and just on the topic of the Jets, Zach, I know you went to MetLife yesterday to participate in the green and white scrimmage. What were some things that really stood out for you there? Well, what people thought about the most probably is that the Jets' defense could have had, could have probably looked like they were getting somewhere, and the offense is still probably a work in pro. It's really a work in progress, and I'm still really eager to see what the probably the top new top three wide receivers for the Jets. Are going to stand out as you get Corey Davis, you get Denzel Mims as long as he stays healthy, and you get the rookie Elijah Moore from Ole Miss. And these all are weapons that I'm really hoping that I really do see giving Zach Wilson the boost. The only thing is, Zach Wilson, according to some people, didn't really look particularly dominant 
in his first scrimmage practice yesterday, going 11 of 24, over 100 yards, and throwing two picks. But don't forget, he's a rookie. This was his first official scrimmage practice of his career. And as far as I'm concerned, it can only get better from there. He still has That's what they're hoping for, too. Take advantage of what he was doing really well with in college, which is his vision down the field and his accuracy throw. Mm -hmm. He didn't show too much of that yesterday, I know, but it's still something that he can really get down. I'm sure that Robert Saleh is really going to like it, too. Well, they like the progress he's making. Even though, as you said, he didn't look good in practice, didn't look good in the public practice, I should say. And, again, we're going to see, I think, a little bit more next week. But, or this coming week, I should say. But the most important thing here is that, again, conflicting philosophies. They, for previous quarterbacks like Sanchez and Geno Smith and those other ones, there was a competition for the job, or at least an artificial competition for the job. They're not even pretending that there's another possibility out there. Zach Wilson is their quarterback through hell or high water. And it's going to be interesting how that philosophy pans out and how much they can prepare him and bring him up to the level he needs to be to start the season for real. It is. I think one thing that works in their favor, though, uh, yeah, despite the fact that really you're looking at a first for everything, because of course, of course, Robert Sala, first head coaching gig, first, especially for the Jets' new system being implemented, obviously from last season and whatever Adam Gase was doing, which I don't think was anything, mm-hmm. maybe four verts every time. But, you know, even with that, I think seeing these practices and scrimmages offensively, I think the connection Zach Wilson and Elijah Moore have built has been incredible and just seeing Wilson's strength and throw power as combined with more speed I think they're going to make for a pretty dynamic duel in the AFC East and to me that's something the Jets were desperately missing last year with Sam Darnold and really no good receiving targets we discussed it a lot last season where it was tough for Sam Darnold to really move the ball through the air because no one was really stepping up and even when a receiver or a tight end got good, he ultimately got injured and ended up missing time. So for the Jets, I think they're in much better position now. And offensively, too, I think even though they're not really sure who's going to fill in positions, I think they're deep in a lot of positions, like running back, defensive end, defensive line in particular, to where it's okay where you can go two or three guys deep because ultimately they're going to keep refining and retooling both offensively and defensively, and build upon it throughout the season to where they're going to remain competitive, I believe, for a lot of the season. I'm not necessarily saying they're going to win 10 games. You know, it's a bit too early to kind of predict that. But I think they're going to be a competitive team this season. Okay. So it's 11.59 and 9 seconds. That means we have to call it a night here on the sports section. On behalf of the WSB Sports Department and also our guest from earlier, women's soccer coach Tobias Bischoff, best of luck to women's soccer because they will literally kick off the Stony Brook season here, the fall season. And, uh, Zach, when is that game at Hofstra? Thursday, August 19th at 7 o'clock. Should we do okay. our have a broadcast for that? Our start time will be 6.45 wsb.fm slash sports we should have the schedule out for you very very soon but in the meantime on behalf of zach ken Furman, carrie quinn our newest member i'm matt mankiewicz have a great sports week everyone and we shall see you next week